now I've started the recording. So we can start the lecture. Wait one second. Okay. This lecture is split in two parts. In the first part, I will talk, and the second part, Roberto Zunino will be the lecturer. This lecture is about transactions as smart signatures in Algram. In the previous lecture, we have seen the, the great breakthrough of Algram. It's uh, proof of stake uh, consensus uh, protocol uh, which enjoys uh, very nice uh, security properties and these properties are uh, uh, formally uh, proved and in particular we have seen a very nice property that is deterministic finality basically it means that there are no forks unlike uh, bitcoin and other blockchains and this part the part about the consensus protocol is the the, the real uh, interesting part uh, of Algorand uh, from a scientific point of view because it allows you to properly formalize the security and to discuss and to devise a consensus protocol that is resistant uh, to attacks. In this lecture, we will uh, introduce uh, transactions uh, and a little bit of smart contracts uh, of Algorand. This part uh, compared to the consensus protocol is less interesting from a foundational point of view, but it is very, very important for developing the smart contract that will run upon Algorand. Differently from Bitcoin and also from Ethereum, Algorand features a quite complex mechanism for transactions. Basically, a transaction is uh, something that you append to the blockchain to say that you want to move uh, some uh, units of cryptocurrency from uh, an account uh, to another. But in Algorand, it, uh, you can do with uh, transactions uh, a lot more, and we will see a few complex mechanisms that uh, are supported by Algorand. And uh, the, the first of these complex mechanisms that we will uh, try to describe is that of smart signatures. What is a smart signature? It is a, a sort of smart contract uh, to some extent, but uh, which cannot maintain the state uh, of the contract. It has no notion of state. You can imagine it uh, as smart signature as a sort of stateless smart contract if you already know the concept of smart contracts from other platforms. Then uh, in the following lectures, uh, we will discuss smart contracts uh, in the state in their stateful form uh, more in detail. But still, uh, knowing uh, the mechanisms of transactions uh, and also the basic signatures is very important because uh, they really have many subtle features. Uh, and if the developer doesn't know uh, these basic mechanisms, uh, risks uh, introducing some vulnerabilities uh, also in the smart contracts. So let's see, this is a summary of, uh, of the lecture, uh, just to say that uh, there are many things that uh, are relevant for these uh, transaction mechanisms, but uh, there is not enough time in a single lecture to cover everything. So uh, if you want to have the, the whole technical details, uh, you should refer to the Algorand developer portal. But still, we will give some pointers to, to, to important things. And uh, another thing that uh, for which there is no time uh, to give all the details uh, during the lecture is uh, uh, the, the experiments. All the things that we will show during this lecture can be experimented uh, through the Algorand sandbox, which is a suite of software that allows you to send transactions uh, to the testnet. And uh, uh, it is very easy to, to install. Uh, yeah, there are the, the basic commands uh, and the link to the documentation. And uh, offline, uh, you can uh, uh, do your own experiments uh, with the testnet. And uh, in this lecture, uh, uh, we will show our examples uh, using uh, the command line interface tools. This is uh, the goal command. 
there are other mechanisms to to uh, publish transactions. Uh, there are uh, SDKs that are better to use uh, for proper uh, smart contract development. But for the lecture, it is simpler to use uh, command lines. So, first topic, uh, very easy: how to transfer cryptocurrency from one user to another user. Before that, uh, let me uh, say that uh, Algorand is, uh, if you already know, Bitcoin uh, is different. It, it is more similar to Ethereum. It has uh, an account-based uh, accounting mechanism. This means that uh, there is no notion of uh, UTXO as in Bitcoin, uh, but there are accounts. And uh, indeed, you can see Algorand uh, as a state machine, if you forget about the consensus protocol, just uh, you can consider Algorand as a black box where users send their transactions, the black box orders this transaction and processes it one at a time. And there is a global state of this machine and every transaction triggers a state transition. So in, uh, in this lecture, we will use uh, a simplified abstract notation to represent uh, these states. For instance, uh, here in this line, we are representing a state where a user A has five algos. This is the crypt native cryptocurrency of Algorand. And another user B has 10 algos. And then, uh, there could be other accounts uh, in the state, but uh, perhaps we don't care for this uh, particular transaction. Then uh, from this state, uh, we can take a step uh, to this other state uh, through a transaction, say, T. And uh, you see that the new state uh, has uh, different amounts for A and B. A now has nine algos and B has six algos. So, these A and B are ideally users, uh, and more precisely, these users are identified as addresses. And the, this uh, A box uh, amount uh, is a user account. It's something that can contain uh, the, the wealth of, of a user. In this particular case, uh, just uh, an amount of values, but then we will see that uh, you can do more. Uh, here, just uh, a slide to uh, see how to create a new account uh, to the goal command. It, it is uh, quite intuitive. And you can, uh, once you have created a few accounts, uh, you can list them and you see that uh, uh, this is the identifier of the account, this long string, it is an address. This is a, a nickname that we we associate to the address. For instance, we have called these three accounts O, A, and B. And here you see the amount of algos stored in each account. This one is very poor, but while this one has five millions of microalgos, that is five algos while B as 10 algos. Uh, there is this offline here, but it is not important for our purpose. It just means that uh, these users are not participating in the, the consensus, uh, but still uh, for all these examples, we are using the testnet, so consensus is not really important. You can uh, quickly become uh, rich uh, in the testnet because there are services that are called faucets that uh, donate uh, algos to anyone uh, who asks. You just, uh, except for robots, if you are a robot, you cannot uh, obtain algos. But uh, it, it is enough to go uh, to one of these faucets. Uh, this is a, a link. You insert your uh, address. Uh, and the faucet donates, uh, say, 10 algos upon uh, each request. 
still uh, these are algos that you can use only in the test net, uh, not in the main net, and so they're useful only for testing purposes. And another tool that is useful uh, is uh, an explorer. For instance, uh, this is uh, an explorer of the test net. Uh, you can insert your address uh, on the uh, text field uh, and you can see all the transactions and the wealth uh, of your address. In this case, you see that this address has a balance of 10 uh, algos, uh, which have been donated by a force through this transaction. And uh, for testing purposes, uh, it, it is useful to, to have these faucets and this explorer. They're very easy to use, so there is no really need to comment them. So let's come back to pay transactions. So what do we want to do with a pay transaction? We have an initial state with A and B, and assume that we want B to pay four algos to A. So this is the first state, uh, this is the, the transaction, ideally, and this is the final state that we want to reach. Uh, in, in, this is uh, from an abstract point of view, but for a more concrete uh, point of view, this transaction uh, has uh, many fields uh, that uh, uh, we, we should look at. So let's see how uh, an actual transaction on Algorand uh, is uh, formed. I can use this uh, command, goal clerk send, to create uh, a pay transaction. Send uh, means uh, I send uh, some algos from uh, an account to another one. In this case, uh, B is the source and A is the target. So B is the sender and A is the receiver. And this is the amount uh, in micro algos that B will send to A. It is four algos. And with this uh, uh, option, I'm, I'm saying that uh, I want that this transaction is written in a file that I'm calling T. Then I can use this other command, gold clerk inspect, to see how this transaction is actually constructed. So it is important to know at least a few of these uh, fields. So let's look at this field here first. This field type uh, says that uh, T is a pay transaction. Okay, uh, there are other kinds of transactions that we will see. Pay is the simplest one. Then uh, this other field, uh, S and D, is the address uh, of the sender and RCV is the address of the receiver, so B and D respectively. Then the amount in microalgos that will be transferred. So the, the atomic amount of currency is the microalg. And then finally this bit more mysterious fee. Fee here is set to 1000 microalgos. And this is the minimum fee that uh, you must pay for each single transaction that you want to send to the Algorand blockchain. It, it is not uh, a high price to pay to use the blockchain. It is a, a very small fee uh, according to the current price of Algo, but still you have to pay this for uh, every transaction. And uh, unlike Bitcoin and Ethereum, where these fees are collected by miners, by daters, uh, in Algorand there is no automatic mechanism implemented in the consensus protocol to distribute this fee to the validators. Uh, the, 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 there is a distribution of fees, but it's uh, stranger, and we won't discuss this uh, in this lecture. But still, users must pay fees to publish their transactions. So there are other two fields that are interesting, these FP and LB. That means first valid and last valid. You know that uh, the transactions that you send to the Algorand blockchain are organized into blocks. There are one block, then another block, and each block contains uh, many transactions. When you publish a transaction, you must specify the first block, the identifier of the first block where this transaction can be published. 
and also the identifier of the last lot. And uh, this first value, the last value, cannot be more distant than uh, 1,000. And uh, in Algorand, you have more or less one new block uh, every four seconds. So let's assume that you want to pay uh, that I'm B and I want to pay A uh, to Algos, uh, but uh, through two different transactions. I cannot send two identical transactions with the same amount, the send the receiver, blah, 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 and the same uh, first value and last value because otherwise I would have a sort of double spending. Only one of these two transactions would be accepted by the blockchain. If you want to do two different payments for the same amount, the same receiver, you must change something between the two transactions. And in particular, you can change this interval. You publish a first transaction with a, with a certain interval. The second transaction has a likely postponed interval. So uh, there is a mechanism uh, implemented in the algorithm said machine that uh, prevents uh, double spending. You cannot publish exactly the same transaction two times. The transaction that I've constructed so far is cannot be directly published. So there is something missing. It misses the, the signature of the sender. So to sign a transaction, user B can use this command line uh, gold clerk sign uh, that uh, with this option produces a new transaction with the same field as the previous one, but now you also have the sequence of B on the transaction. And once B has signed the transaction, I, B can send this transaction to the blockchain. And uh, there is this common row send that allows B to perform this. And uh, once, uh, of course, uh, you, you cannot wait too much to send this transaction because otherwise uh, the, the time interval where the transaction is valid uh, uh, is no longer uh, valid, but uh, if publish this transaction in time and if you have enough uh, money to allow this transaction, you see that if you inspect uh, the accounts, uh, that uh, something uh, happened to the balances of A and B. In particular, A has received uh, the four algos, uh, and B has spent the four algos plus uh, the one thousand micro algos for the fee. Uh, you, if you want, if you prefer, you can also directly send the transaction uh, without uh, uh, writing it before on a file. Just omit the minus off leg. And this will directly send the transaction without asking uh, B for the signature. The signature is appended, but uh, you can you you do this in a single step. So back to our abstract notation, this is the starting state, and this is uh, our abstract notation for the transaction. We have a transaction, let's say T, which is a pay transaction with sender B, receiver A, amount of four algos. Of course, there should be micro algos, uh, four million, the fee, and uh, Besides the transaction, to make it publishable, B must provide uh, his signature on the transaction. And if you and uh, if everything uh, is correct, uh, you reach this state. Now, uh, in the following slides, uh, for simplicity, sometimes we will we'll omit uh, the fees, the signatures, but uh, this will only for improve readability. You can do the things more precisely if you want. So by using pay transactions, so you can do also something a bit more complex. Let's see what happens in this light. You have an initial state now with three users, A, B, and C. 
and uh, you can craft a transaction which is still a pay transaction for the sender B, the receiver A, and the same amount as before. But now you can add uh, this extra field. This, this means that uh, this transaction will transfer uh, four algos uh, from B to A as before, exactly as before. But besides this, uh, all the remaining algos uh, in the account of B will be transferred to C. So all the rest goes to C. So if you run this transaction, you see that uh, A will still receive uh, uh, the four algos, while the rest uh, will be taken uh, from C. And uh, what happened to B's account? Uh, the account of B has been closed. Logically, the, the blockchain uh, doesn't need to record that uh, this account exists. So it, logically, it would be something like a, an account with zero algos. But zero algos is something that the blockchain doesn't need to record. You can uh, reopen uh, the account. Uh, you can do this by just uh, sending algos to this account. So what happens to the structure of the transaction uh, if you add the closed field? Just uh, there is a new field which specifies uh, the address uh, of the account uh, where you want to send the rest of the algos. And uh, in the command line, uh, we have added this minus C option. So let's consider this uh, sort of, say, attack. Let's assume that A has one algo and uh, sends a pay transaction to some other uh, user B1 with a very tiny amount. Then A can create uh, a new or uh, can create a new account or uh, send something to an existing account. Uh, but the blockchain, uh, the algorithm state machine, uh, must record uh, in the state somewhere that uh, this account with this tiny amount of algos exists. And they can continue to do this many, many times because uh, every time uh, sends uh, an epsilon uh, algos to someone else. And in this way, I'm, uh, I'm uh, creating a sort of garbage on the blockchain. Uh, many, many accounts. Uh, with the tiny amounts of algos. So to prevent these uh, sort of attacks, the algorithm state machine requires that uh, every account uh, has uh, at least uh, a minimal amount uh, of algos, that is uh, at least uh, 0.1 algos. It is not much, but at least uh, it prevents from this kind of attacks. So these attack, this pay transaction with a small amount, uh, where before uh, B1 was not on the blockchain, the transaction would not be possible. It's not, it is not possible. So the garbage attack, let's say, doesn't exist. So the state machine just needs to record the accounts with at least 0.1 algos. The other accounts do not exist. Logically, if you want, you can imagine there are accounts with zero algo, but the state machine doesn't need to waste the space uh, to memorize these accounts because they have nothing. So let's consider this uh, a bit strange uh, situation. You have two users, A and B, Let's say that uh, they both have five algos. And they decide that no, I, I no longer want my algos. Uh, I want to close my account uh, and donate uh, everything to B. Is it possible to do this uh, without using uh, the close field? Uh, not properly. Let's imagine uh, what would happen if an adversary sends uh, a small amount of algos to A before this transaction is appended. 
what is the behavior that you respect here? If the in adversary send uh, say one micro algo to A first, then uh, this transaction uh, would not really be possible because uh, A would uh, reach a state where uh, it would violate uh, the constraint uh, on the least uh, amount of algos that uh, you must have to exist as an account. So the algorithm state machine uh, uh, would consider the, the, the transaction pay as invalid. So this, is, this explains why the, the close uh, functionality is needed in this setting. Okay. So now the payments uh, are the basic feature of uh, any transaction or any blockchain. But you can do more. For instance, you can have accounts controlled by more than a single user. Let's see in practice what we can do in algorithm. I use this notation to denote an account which is not controlled by a single user like A or B before. This is an account with five algos that is controlled by any two users out of these three users, A, B, and C. This man, means that uh, A alone cannot uh, pay anything from this account, and neither B nor C. But any two of these users together can uh, trigger a payment from this account. For instance, here, there is, uh, let's say, another account uh, with D. And uh, here, A and B can uh, sign a transaction T, which is a payment uh, where the sender is this account uh, and the receiver is D, and the amount is one algo. And uh, provided that the transaction contains the signature of at least two of these three users, then this payment uh, succeeds uh, and uh, you, we remove one algo from here and we add an algo to this account. Now, our notation is a bit abstract. In practice, uh, you would see a, a normal a normal address, a long sequence of uh, letters and numbers, uh, but this uh, address uh, is interpreted by Algorand as a multi sig account. Okay. And um, there are uh, command line uh, facilities to create this uh, multi sig account. Uh, they're not exactly as the one uh, shown before. You have to add basically this multi-sig keyword. Here we are creating uh, this multi-sig account uh, with three addresses. And this option means that uh, we require a threshold of two out of these three. And then uh, there are specific commands uh, for signing uh, Multi sig transaction. Here I'm adding uh, the signatures of uh, AA and BB to the transaction. And once I have uh, the signature of AA and BB, I can uh, actually send this transaction. Okay. I think uh, I finished uh, with the, the first part uh, of this lecture. Now, Roberto will uh, present uh, the smart signatures. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we need to share my screen. Okay. I think I can stop that. Let's see if this works.
Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, uh, so far we have seen how to perform uh, basic transfers using uh, algorithm transactions. Now uh, we are going to move towards smart signatures. What is a smart signature? Well, in principle, it is a generalization of the transaction authorization mechanism we have seen so far. Let's uh, re review what, what we have seen. We have seen that uh, when we want to transfer currency from an account like this, we need to provide a transaction and uh, uh, sign it using uh, the sender key. So essentially to tell Algorand, to tell the Algorand blockchain that this transaction is authorized, we use cryptography. We use uh, a digital signature. For multi-sig addresses, the mechanism is similar. The only difference is that uh, instead of providing just one signature, we provide uh, possibly more signatures. So for instance, this was an account uh, two out of three. So you need to provide at least two signatures from these users in TTP. Now, instead, we can also use smart signature. What is the idea? Instead of having a transaction T and a few signatures to authorize T, we can have a transaction T and generic arguments, just bytes. And uh, how do you say, how do you check that these uh, arguments and these transactions are indeed authorized? Well, you allow the user, the creator of this account, uh, intuitively, to specify a program that uh, will perform uh, the required logic, the required checks. The idea is that instead, in, instead of having uh, a fixed mechanism, you need to sign and authorize them. Here, you just need to provide the right arguments uh, to satisfy this program. If this program uh, tells that T is authorized by the arguments, then it is authorized, otherwise it is objected and it will never be put in the blockchain. How does this work in more detail? Well, the idea is that this new kind of account is uh, still an account as the one we have seen so far. So a smart signature is still an account, an account that can receive algos from anyone. Uh, as we have seen, uh, there is no way to limit it, to constrain uh, uh, algos being sent to an account. And uh, uh, of course, you can also uh, take algos from this account and transfer them to others. But uh, uh, when you transfer algos outside the account, outside the smart signature, now you no longer need a signature. You need to do whatever the program of the smart signature tells you to do. You need to satisfy the requirements of the smart signature. Now, uh, so this means that the creator of the smart signature needs to write some code. This code, uh, defining the logic of the account, is written using a language called TIL. This is a minimalistic language, so to speak. It is an assembly-like language, so it is a fairly low-level language, which is stack-based. And uh, in this language, you can find uh, many of codes, many instructions, many commands uh, that allow the program to uh, inspect uh, pa the parts of T, the arguments, uh, and, uh, performs, uh, and perform uh, essentially general checks on those. Indeed, uh, using uh, a suitable Till program, till script, we can put almost any constraint on T 
with my desire. So it's a very flexible and very general. The program uh, written in TIL language is uh, written as a text file as we write programs in any programming language like C, Java, or many others. But uh, after we have written uh, this text file, this uh, source code, you can then uh, compile it uh, to some bytecode, to a sequence of bytes, uh, which, are, uh, which is the executable form of the smart signature. And uh, this bytecode is, is meant to be run on the AVM, the Algorand virtual machine. Uh, once you have generated this bytecode, then the address of this of the account is simply uh, constructed by taking the hash of the bytecode. So essentially, you write a program, you compile it to bytecode, to, to bytes, to execute, executable bytes, and then you just hash that to obtain the address of the account. And then uh, you can do anything you can do with an address, for instance, sending uh, address to, to that account. Let's just uh, have a quick overview of uh, some constraints uh, one might desire to enforce uh, uh, using TIL. These are just uh, a few examples. This list is not exhaustive, uh, just uh, this is just to have an idea of uh, what kind of things uh, you might want to do. So, for instance, if you have a small signature and you want to authorize a pay taking uh, currency, taking algos out of it, uh, you can, for instance, require that uh, T, the transaction, uh, must have an amount which is less than five algos. This means uh, um, that uh, uh, if the transaction tries to take uh, more than five algos, uh, the transaction is rejected. You can also you can only take five. By the way, of course, uh, some of you might uh, already have uh, noticed that uh, this is a check which is uh, performed on a single transaction. So if I put a transaction on the blockchain which takes four algos. That's authorized. If uh, after five seconds I put another one which takes other uh, for algos, then that transaction is also authorized. So one needs to be a bit careful because this amount uh, is the amount of a single transaction, not the total amount. So be careful on that. Also, you can check that uh, the receiver of uh, this uh, transaction, this pay transaction, must be one uh, among a few hard-coded addresses. You can write uh, a list of, uh, say, five addresses, whatever, in, in, in the smart signature, in the code of the smart signature, so that uh, you check that the receiver must be one of them. In this way, you can take uh, algos out of the smart signature, but you cannot send them to anyone. You have to uh, send to one of these addresses. Of course, the addresses can be regular addresses uh, of users. It, they can be multi-sig addresses, but they can also be other smart signatures. They can be any form of as another example, we can uh, see that we can inspect the arguments. For instance, we might require that argument one must be a signature by participant A of, uh, say, a message hello. So this means that uh, to authorize the transaction, uh, there must be a participant A which has to provide a signature and a signature of uh, the message. The, the, the smart signature requires. So this is a cryptographic signature used as an argument of a smart signature. This is one of the, basically, this is similar to the standard authorization mechanism. We use check signature. But uh, with, the sun, with the standard mechanism, you can only check signature on the world transaction, 
while uh, in uh, using TIL, uh, you can check signatures on uh, arbitrary messages and many other constraints. You can uh, call the many other constraints. As another example, you can check that uh, one argument uh, is a hash pre-image of some known constant. This means that uh, the hash, the cryptographic hash of uh, this, uh, these bytes, uh, the second argument, uh, is uh, uh, the hash of this is indeed equal to a hard-coded constant in the code. Essentially, this means that uh, whoever created the contract uh, uh, took some bytes, uh, hashed them, and included the hash in, in the small signature code, and then uh, uh, to uh, satisfy, uh, to perform an authorization, uh, that participant will have to reveal uh, the bytes which were hashed, the hash per image. So you can check essentially if a secret, if a committed secret was revealed at a certain point. You can also check some temporal constraints. So uh, the TIL code here can uh, access the transaction, the first valid field and the last valid field, and the require that, for instance, the first valid is, uh, say, in uh, two months uh, from now. In this way, essentially, you create a smart signature uh, from which you cannot take cargos until that time you essentially require uh, the transaction to be appended to the blockchain only in the future and not right now. Again, this is just a, a small list of things you can check, but as you can see, the mechanism is very versatile. Let's uh, uh, instead move uh, uh, to the practice. Uh, how do you work with the smart signatures? Well, there are many ways to do it, but a possible TIL workflow is the following. First of all, you program, you write a TIL program, which is a text file using the TIL opcodes. This is the smart signature.til. Let's assume we, we write this using a text editor. Then we run this command. Uh, goal clear compile with uh, the smart signature, and this produces uh, a smart signature address. This is essentially the hash of uh, the bytecode. And once you know the smart signature uh, address, you can simply send currency to that, uh, effectively creating the smart signature on the blockchain. By the way, when you send currency, you are still subject to the same limitations as for regular accounts. So for instance, uh, a smart signature address can never have less than one tenth of algo. So uh, you, you cannot have uh, a smart signature with less than that. You still have to provide at least that amount. So if you do it uh, as an experiment, remember that you still have to put enough currency, so send more than one fence, probably more if you then want to uh, take uh, the, the currency back. Okay. Uh, after we have sent some currency, you might then want to take it back. And to take the currency away from the smart signature, you have to satisfy the problem. How do you do that? Well, you use a goal clerk send, and instead of writing simply from account, as we have seen in previous examples, you now need to write from program and pass the till code. So effectively, uh, you, you need to tell this command that uh, the source, the, the send address is a smart signature. By doing that, you need, of course, to specify the, um, the two fields, so the receiver, uh, and here I just uh, wrote A as a user, as an address for a user. 
I am requiring a goal to write the transaction to file T, and I'm also asking to add some arguments to the transaction. These arguments are just bytes, and they have to be encoded in the so-called base64 format, which is just a way to write any sequence of bytes as a readable ASCII uh, sequence of characters, of readable characters. Uh, so this is just a way to uh, build one uh, transaction T. After we have built the transaction T, you can then send it to the, blo to the blockchain uh, uh, as for, uh, with other transactions. So you can just say, go clerk, roll send T, dash F T. This dash F is not from, it is fire, but uh, it's just a way to send the uh, transaction. This is one possible workflow. There are several variants to it you might want to experiment with. Let's see, for instance, uh, uh, how you can add the signatures beyond arguments before we performed many steps, and then we created the transaction T, adding some arguments. If you then want to add the signatures uh, on, as an argument, you need to first create T, the transaction, and then uh, use the command gold clerk till sign with a bunch of arguments. This is uh, the file uh, containing the secret key you are using to sign. Uh, see the documentation to, act, to actually uh, know how to get that file from Goal uh, and from the uh, testnet suite, essentially. And here, I'm specifying here that uh, the transaction, the file to sign is T, the transaction is T. And here, I'm specifying that the signature uh, on that must be added as an argument in position one. So essentially, here I had an argument which ended in position zero. And here I'm telling this command add the signature in position one. If you don't do that, the, the signature is added in, uh, in uh, I think, in position zero. And so it will overwrite that. Be careful not to overwrite uh, a previous argument. Otherwise, you will simply lose it. By the way, you can still use Goal Clerk Inspect to check the transaction before sending it to the blockchain to visually inspect the transaction manually. At the end, after adding the signature, you can simply send the transaction. So this is one possible variant. Another variant is instead using some higher level language like Python to generate the TIL code. There is a library called PyTIL, which, uh, uh, which helps in performing this task. The idea is that you first manually use a text editor to write Python code using the PyTIL library, so smartsignature.python, and then you simply execute the Python code and that will generate the TIL uh, source code. After you have that, you can simply repeat what uh, we have just seen. You compile the code uh, and uh, everything else. The advantage of do, uh, doing this is that uh, uh, instead of dealing with the lower level TIL code, you deal with the PyTIL uh, library, which is in Python, which is more programmer friendly. It's easier to read uh, and to use. So I recommend you to use this, but uh, I think in, uh, we are going to see some examples in the next lectures. So let me just show uh, a very basic example of uh, a, smart, a smart signature. Suppose that we have a participant A, which wants to send, which want to send a 1,000 algo birthday present to B. 
And the idea is that uh, A sends a uh, uh, thousand algos uh, to this Mark signature birthday. And this Mark signature will allow B to redeem the present to get the 1000 algos only after his birthday, let's say New Year's Eve. And uh, for simplicity, let's just uh, uh, code uh, a smart signature birthday, which checks the following condition. We should check that uh, we authorize only pay transactions. We authorize the transactions only if the receiver is B. So we don't want uh, our present to go, to go to someone else. So we check that the receiver is B. And then we check that uh, B doesn't uh, get uh, his present uh, uh, too early. So we check that uh, the first round, the first valid round, which is uh, FV, the FV field in the transaction, must be at least uh, the round of New, uh, New, uh, New Year's Eve. This is just one example. How do you do that in practice? Uh, in using Python code, uh, you can proceed as follows. You first specify the address of B using this line. Then you specify the border around the time limit, uh, the, uh, the algorithm round expected on uh, that day. By the way, this uh, 444 is just a dummy number. I didn't really compute the exact uh, but you get the idea. Then uh, what you can do, uh, here I wrote uh, I see a simple function which returns uh, this expression. This expression is a PyTIL, uh, here I'm using PyTIL, the PyTIL library, and I'm saying that the condition I want to check is a name, the condition of three requirements. I'm checking, I'm requiring that the transaction type must be a pay, the receiver must be a B, and the first valid must be at least the border round. After I've generated this, uh, when I run the script, I'm printing the result of the, this command, uh, compile till, uh, which will take the, this expression and uh, it will generate till code uh, to actually perform these checks. The till code is, by the way, this. Here you can see that uh, more or less the checks are performed. This code intuitively takes, uh, take the type of the transaction, take the pay constant, integer constant, and then check if that they are equal. Take the receiver uh, field of the transaction, take this constant address, check that they are equal, and then compute the end of this, the result of this point and the result of this point. Then check this as well, take the end of this and everything before, and finally return. As you can see, it is a stack based, so you have to imagine things put on a stack and then retrieved by your codes. It's a bit more complicated. By using PyTIL, it is more straightforward. So uh, now, the one needs to be very careful when using smart signatures because uh, uh, you are authorizing uh, probably many transactions, not just one. So you have to be careful about the requirements. If you forget some check, it is possible that you are also authorizing some uh, transaction you didn't intend to authorize. And so you allow a tax. Let's see, for instance, how one could attack the previous mass signature. The idea is this. An adversary M, Mallory, can wait the birthday date and then steal the 1,000 algos by using this transaction. Let's see what it is. The sender is the birthday, the small signature. The receiver is B. So, uh, so, so far, so good. But then instead of transferring a thousand algos, there is zero algos uh, uh, transferred. And indeed, we didn't check for, uh, for that. Hmm. Well, but still the receiver is B. So what could go wrong? Well, 
we have the first value the equal to four, four and so on. So this is still okay. But then there is a close remainder two field telling essentially that this transaction should send zero values to V and everything else in the smart signature to M. So because there is this closed field, which we didn't check in the, in the PyTL code, now B will receive a present of zero and then instead we take everything else. What is the uh, thumb rule here? The thumb rule is that when you check uh, some uh, fields, uh, be, uh, be careful because uh, just because you only check these fields, uh, this doesn't mean that the other fields of the transaction aren't set to some malicious value. So in this case, you need to check that the close remainder to field, the close field was actually not set or concretely set to zero in the transaction. You need to explicitly require don't, uh, don't uh, use close remainder to. Or alternatively, instead of checking receiver equal B, you could instead say, uh, check that the close address, the close remainder to is also B, so that uh, B will receive the one amount. By the way, uh, if you look at the uh, Algorand uh, developer uh, resources, the documentation, you will see that there are many other fields that could be set in a transaction. And uh, potentially those, uh, a few of those must also be checked because uh, they might be set to some bad value. Uh, indeed, as an if you want to do some exercise, you, you can find other attacks beyond this one. So I'm not su actually suggesting you really use this code. This is just for illustration purposes. Okay, in, let me move on. I want to move to a more sophisticated example uh, using an oracle, which is the idea. Uh, we want to write uh, a smart signature here called oracle, uh, which uh, essentially um, will provide some algos to the winner of the competition between A and B. To know who is the winner, there is uh, another participant O, which is actually the external oracle, uh, which will announce uh, the winner, essentially a kind of judge, if you prefer. The idea is then uh, when O says that A is the winner, saying zero, then the oracle should transfer the prize to A, otherwise to B. Let's see it concretely. When the O participant provides the signature, a signature of zero, essentially, and prefixed with the Oracle address, this is actually required by Abrand, then we want this smart signature to enable this transaction. And this transaction contains a pay towards A with close remainder two, so transferring everything. Zero is an argument which is indicating that A was the winner, and the signature of the of participant O uh, essentially uh, certifying that uh, this winner is indeed the intended one. So uh, the winner zero is indeed the correct one. And similarly, if instead the O participants, uh, participant signs one uh, with this other transaction and uh, arguments, one can transfer the price to B. This is uh, the intuition. Uh, please note that uh, when the Oracle, when O, the O participant, uh, certifies that the winner is zero, that is the winner is A, then B must not be allowed to specify one as the first argument, but then using the signature, which a signature which does not certify that one was signed. So 
you really need to check that the signature is correct. So let's see uh, quickly some code. This is again a PyTeal. Here we have uh, three addresses for A, B, and O, the participants. We have now two constants, uh, the byte representation of the string zero and of the string one uh, for the two messages. And the code is more or less uh, as the one for the board uh, example, of the board present example. But now uh, the expression is more sophisticated. It is the end of these three conditions, tx pay versus o, and then the or of these two. Let's see what these are. The first part, tx pay, checks that uh, the type of the transaction is pay and that the amount is zero. So it, it, pay checks that the transaction is moving zero um, algos to the receiver. So it doesn't matter who the receiver is. And then uh, later on, we will check that uh, uh, there is the close field set to the actual recipient. So, uh, so we are really transferring everything, all the price to the intended uh, receiver. Recipient. Then what do we do? We check the signature. Versigo checks that uh, uh, arg zero, so the zero of uh, arg in the uh, transaction is actually signed by O, so by this address, uh, and the signature is stored in arg one. So back to the previous slide, we really check that uh, arg zero, which is this one, is as indeed its signature as uh, the second argument. And so this uh, checks the signature. And finally, uh, we, as a third requirement, we check that we either make A win or we will make B win. And indeed, if we close towards A, we check that the arg zero is indeed uh, this constant. So we check that the arg zero is indeed the, the zero constant we expect. And then uh, we also check that the close field uh, is set to A. And similarly for B, we check that the arg zero is the constant one and the close is set to B. So this is, is one way to make it work. Uh, be careful that uh, you might find uh, the solution not very satisfactory, because what happens if the O judge, the, this Oracle participant, actually is lazy or has a fault or uh, is prevented from uh, signing, maybe they lost their keys, maybe something happened. In that case, if the smart signature is this, uh, then the price will be get stuck forever inside the Oracle smart signature. Essentially, the currency is frozen forever. Uh, and this is a liquidity problem. Uh, you might not like this uh, feature of the smart signature, and you might want to do an exercise to provide a way out. For instance, you might require that uh, after some time, maybe after uh, one week, one month, whatever, then uh, if uh, no answer from participant or was uh, signed, if uh, no announcement was made, then uh, all the price uh, is sent away, for instance, or, or to be, or maybe to someone else. Um, you can uh, just, uh, as an exercise, an exercise modify the smart signature to allow to authorize this transaction, but only after a given time, so that uh, the judge all has some. Uh, uh, time to actually announce the winner. Okay. Uh, in the remaining time, I want to uh, talk about uh, another feature of Algorand, which uh, is custom assets. 
Algorand deals with the algo currency mostly, but uh, Algorand can also deal uh, as a primitive uh, with uh, custom assets, so with uh, user created tokens, so to speak. And the idea is that uh, there are uh, uh, certain uh, transactions types like uh, asset configure, uh, which uh, can deal with uh, the creation and the handling of uh, assets of custom token. Uh, here, for instance, a participant P owning five others decides to create uh, a new coin, a new currency, a new, a new currency and uses this transaction, a configure, uh, to generate 1,000 new uh, coins of this uh, newly minted uh, currency. Okay. In the end, uh, this means that in the account of B, we find not only five algos, but also 1,000 full coins. By the way, uh, there is an anti-spam constraint uh, in the sense that, uh, um, in principle, if this uh, was not constrained, uh, a participant could create uh, full coin one, full coin two, full coin three, full coin four, can simply uh, make the, the size of the account very large, adding uh, uh, garbage uh, currencies uh, uh, every single second, uh, every single block. Almost. This uh, is forbidden, or it, or it is instead constrained, by requiring that uh, uh, an account must contain at least a tenth of algo for each currency type. So, for instance, here, uh, since we have two currencies, algo and two coins, uh, this transaction must contain at least two tenths of algos. Uh, so, uh, to create uh, a, a coin, to store a few coins, uh, you need to keep at least a little amount of algos there just to justify the extra effort of the blockchain. After we have created the um, coins, you can transfer them. What is the mechanism of transferring them? Well, there is a special transaction, a transaction type called transfer. You have to specify the asset sender and asset receiver, as we, more or less as we do for standard algos, the asset amount, one full coin, and then you have to specify the asset ID, the full coin uh, unique uh, ID. Now, in principle, uh, you might uh, you might uh, send uh, uh, full coins to anyone. So you might take one of these uh, uh, of these one thousand full coins and send it away. So so that be uh, is as nine. 999 full coins and others one. In principle, this is the basic mechanism. But uh, uh, since there is uh, indeed this anti spam constraint, uh, receiving uh, a full coin by, uh, by A would also block uh, a tenth of an algo. Uh, and so uh, by default, this transfer is disallowed. So A cannot receive full coins until A explicitly opts in the currency. So in other hand, you can always say send algos to anyone. Algos can always be sent anywhere. But if you invent a custom currency, you can only send that to the accounts uh, who opted in to the accounts. So the idea is that indeed this is allowed and you need a special opt-in transaction uh, made by A to accept that. And the mechanism is more or less the following. At the beginning, A has only five algos, B has algos and two coins. Then there is a transaction, I'm not showing the, the, the details, but there is a special transaction to say, I am A and uh, I want to opt in in full coins and I sign that with the key of A. 
And then uh, uh, in the account, essentially, from that point onwards, you have zero foo coins, meaning you are ready to receive uh, foo coins. And now using the asset transfer transaction, the one we have seen before, you can actually send one foo coin to A. So remember, you have to opt in if you use custom assets. There, is, uh, there are actually several sophisticated features of assets. One uh, of the perhaps less intuitive one uh, is the clawback mechanism. And uh, one needs to be a bit careful on that. Uh, let me comment on this feature. The idea is that uh, uh, suppose that, uh, uh, as we have just seen, A received one foo coin from B, and B was the creator of the foo coin, the, the account who generated the, the, the coin. There is a special move, which is called a clawback, which allows B who is the owner of the foo coins, the generator of the foo coins, to, to take, to steal, essentially, the coin back. It is possible. Uh, to disallow that, uh, to be sure that you actually own a token, you receive the, uh, a full coin, uh, and you want to be sure that uh, that coin is yours and nobody can throw it back, then you need to check that uh, the, the account uh, of um, the account who generated the coins has no clawback address set. If there is a clawback address, that address can uh, perform the clawback and uh, essentially steal the coin. From you. So if you receive a token, check immediately check if there is a clawback address because they might take it back. This is one thing to check. On top of that, there is also another feature which is called the asset manager address, which is the manager of the new currency, which can perform several operations, including setting the clawback address. So if you want to uh, check in the clawback address, uh, that there is no clawback address is not enough because the manager could set the clawback address and then steal the coin. So you need to also check that the manager address is empty or that it is something you can trust. Uh, I believe that this feature was introduced so that there is, uh, uh, um, in certain cases, it could be useful to have a sort of manager of uh, these coins. So the coins can circulate, but there is still an authority on those which can take, take them back. Uh, by the way, if they are taken back, uh, this is still stored on the blockchain. So it's... Uh, visible to everyone that we have essentially stolen uh, uh, things back. But still, want to be sure, remember, no clawback, no manager. One, uh, uh, okay, still 10 minutes. Uh, a few other features. One of is, uh, one of the nice one is uh, called Atomic Groups which enables one to perform a set of transactions atomically. So uh, suppose that we are in this state, A has opted in uh, two coins and uh, A uh, wants to, uh, and A has a few others, B has a few others and B owns two four coins. And suppose that B wants to uh, exchange one of the coins with one of the algos, okay, and vice versa. So they want to perform an exchange. In principle, you could perform an exchange. You can simply transfer the coin from B to A, and then with another transaction, transfer the algo from A to B. You could do that. But, uh, um, but if you do that with two different separate transactions, uh, you have no guarantee that they will both be executed. Uh, in principle, uh, you perform the first one and then the second one uh, 
uh, you have no guarantee that the second one is actually uh, performed, even if uh, the transaction were both signed in advance. For instance, uh, uh, A might uh, receive the full coin and then immediately transfer the full coin and all the algos to us, uh, an account A prime to an, a third account so that, uh, that in the, the new state B can no longer receive the one algo uh, which was the payment for the full coin. When you want to run, to execute either a group, either all the transactions or none of them, you can use an atomic group. Uh, and so you have to guarantee that they are executed one after the other immediately, all of them or none. Uh, by the way, when you perform this kind of grouping, the signatures, uh, some signatures now cover the whole group. You are not signing the first transaction, <clears throat> the first transaction, and then signing the second one. You are uh, making a signature which covers both of them for obvious reasons, so that you cannot uh, take the transactions apart and uh, perform attacks. So, atomic groups is uh, a nice uh, uh, feature. And in principle, you can uh, even uh, uh, use it to do a variant of the Oracle example we have seen before, so that when the Oracle participant doesn't announce any winner, you can make it so after a certain amount of time, a certain amount goes to A, another amount goes to B, and maybe a third amount goes to a O watcher, which will then start an investigation on uh, this judge in the real world and uh, ask them uh, why they didn't announce any winner, uh, what went wrong. And when you want to perform several transfers all together at the same time, uh, you want uh, to use uh, a uh, group, an atomic group of transactions. By the way, uh, in, this most, in this smart signature uh, code in TIL and in PyTIL by extension, uh, you can uh, um, actually access uh, all the transactions in the group. So you can ask, uh, uh, how many transactions are in the group? Four, that's okay. Uh, is the first transaction, uh, uh, has the first transaction, the field close set to this? So you can inspect all the fields of all the transactions in the transaction. Then, in the very last part, in time, I just want to show one very last uh, feature of Algorand, which is the rekeying uh, operation. Uh, this is an operation which is uh, piggybacked uh, intuitively on the pay transactions, which can be piggybacked on that. And it is that a pay transaction beyond the, the fields we have seen can also have a rekey field. What happens? In this case, if uh, here I have uh, an account A with five algos, an account B with one algo, an account C with one algo, then uh, if I perform uh, this transaction, T, uh, this uh, transaction moves one algo from A to B, so one algo from A to B. And however, it will also rekey the account, the sender account A with the address C. And this is denoted in this notation by putting C here. The, if this transaction is authorized by signing with, with A, the one algo is transferred and the rekey operation uh, uh, succeeded as denoted by BC. Now that we have rekeyed this account, we are now in a state where to get currency from this account, we no longer have to use the previous key A, this A here, but we now have to use the new key, the key of C. 
This means that from now on, uh, essentially, this account is under the control of C. And indeed, using the signature of key, we can then sign a, a pay transaction, moving a, a, another algo from A to B. So this account uh, drops to three algos, and uh, we, ha we have one more algo uh, sent to B. Now, uh, as you can imagine, uh, uh, when you sign a transaction, be, uh, you don't trust, you have not generated yourself, be very careful that there is no rekeying, because otherwise you are essentially uh, allowing uh, a malicious participant uh, to uh, get, to take control of uh, all your currency. And uh, even, e and uh, moreover, when you are writing uh, the, the code of Asimar signature, you also need to uh, perform a similar check. Because uh, if you don't check if uh, the rekey field and you simply allow a pay, uh, this might be dangerous because maybe you think you are only authorizing the payment of uh, a single, a uh, single algo, and instead you are doing that and changing the key, the spend key of the account. So be very careful when you. The general idea is that every time you write a smart signature, be very careful in checking all the fields of the of the transaction you are authorizing. Uh, if uh, read all the fields in the algorithm documentation, if some of them can be set to some malicious value, causing some un unintended behavior, uh, then uh, you want your smart signature to check those fields uh, to be set to a harmless value. In this case, uh, just check that the key is zero. So that uh, the, the rekeying zero means uh, there is no rekeying. So uh, essentially, that's it. Uh, before ending uh, the talk, uh, um, I just want to uh, uh, answer one uh, observation uh, which was made in the question. Uh, in the first part, there was a typo indeed here. Uh, we wrote one algo by mistake here, but indeed it was free. Let's uh, review this slide again. This was about the close remainder two. This was a pay moving four algos from B to A. So four of these five algos are moved to A. So um, uh, A moves from five to nine, but then the close remainder two field uh, is set to C, meaning that everything else, so the one algo which is remaining, is instead sent to C. So this algo is moved uh, here. And uh, there was a typo here, there was a one, but it is indeed a three, as uh, some of you uh, asked. Okay, there are also another couple of questions. Uh, okay, I, 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 I didn't. Uh... Perhaps I can uh, answer okay, sure. first. Uh, let me read it. Uh, Uros uh, uh, writes that when the clawback address is disabled, uh, it can be re enabled even ah, if the okay. asset manager is enabled. Uh, it's true, in the documentation, this thing is made explicit. Uh, Still, uh, this is a thing that uh, we have never tested in our experiment. And uh, in general, okay. in general, uh, if you look at Thank the documentation uh, of Algorand, you see that, that there are many, many corner cases where, where uh, it is not clear, or, or but in some cases it is somehow hidden in the documentation. Uh, in some other cases, it is not uh, precisely specified. So uh, what we try to do, uh, is to construct a model of the transaction mechanism and uh, we published a paper at financial cryptography last year but uh, this paper does not cover everything there are still some corner cases like this one that are not covered by our forum model still it is important i think to have besides the documentation uh, 
some uh, uh, formalization of this model uh, to capture all these corner cases. So the other questions, uh, Roberto, do you want to see to uh, say the, something about uh, Nicolò? The, the, the reking is a recent feature, and uh, if I have understood it correctly, the idea is that uh, uh, you change the key of an existing account so that uh, whoever wants to send uh, uh, currency to that account can still use the same address. But instead to spend uh, the, um, the currency, uh, you use a new key, essentially. Uh, so uh, essentially you decouple the others for sending and the others from the ceiling, very, very roughly. It, it, if you use it uh, in a reckless way, it, it, it can be it can be a bit uh, dangerous. So uh, uh, one needs to be a bit careful. How do you see the no clawback address of an asset? With Explorer, uh, yes. I think uh, using the Explorer, you should uh, see uh, the, by using the asset ID, you should be able to in in inspect the, the, if there is a clawback address. Okay, thank you. So our time is finished for this lecture. Let's see there is 45 a... uh, for uh, the second. Ah, yes, the, the, there is a break. There is a break now. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.